Well, what did you make of that? <laughs> Good evening, everybody. For those of you who haven't been initiated, that's what heavy metal music sounds like. Actually, it goes a bit further than that. That's what they call death metal. And this is a group called Necrotomy. Now, Necrotomy, like most of the other death metal groups, play music that's not just only loud and aggressive. It's, it's, it's obsessed with death, uh, suicide, violence, anarchy, really black stuff. The kind of stuff that scares the daylights out of nice, respectable, middle-class people. And there's a lot of concern about the effect that it's having on kids, because it really does have a cult following this sort of stuff. In the United States, there's been a spate of adolescent suicides that have been directly linked to this kind of music. I mean, just a couple of cases that have gone to court. In California, a 17-year-old boy locked himself in his car and gassed himself while he listened to Ozzy Osbourne playing Suicide Solution. The tape was still playing next morning when they found his body. In Reno, another two teenage, teenage boys made a suicide pact and shot themselves after they'd locked themselves away for hours listening to music by Judas Priest. Now, in both those cases, the parents claimed that the music had contributed directly to the suicides. So what effect is this music having on the kids who listen to it? And Perhaps what we older ones need to try and understand is why are they attracted to such black and macabre themes? And, and what are these groups trying to say? Well, why are you attracted by themes like this? Can you explain? Something different. Something is certainly different. Yeah. But is it, is it just simply an attempt to shock? No, no, they've, no? Gone, they've gone through that stage a long time ago. I think they've pretty much done lot, most things that will shock people. Mm -hmm. It's just following through afterwards. Goes oh. after music. What is it? The lyrics go after the music. It's just aggressive, the music. So you've got to have something hard hitting to go after the music. It's certainly hard hitting, but uh, you see, the other thing too is that I just wonder how important the lyrics are, because the lyrics, when you actually know what you're singing there, really are quite shocking to a lot of people. But are you meant to understand the lyrics? Lot people are attracted to the music for the music, not for lyrics. Not for the you lyrics. You can't understand the lyrics, so... That's I right, know. but see, I mean, I'm told that, that, that a lot of the metalheads, is that what you call them, metalheads? They sit people. listening to this sort of stuff, actually have the words written in front of them, and they're listening to the music and they're actually going through those words like that, and they're taking it all in. No, not really. Oh, some albums have got lyrics printed on them, but... Uh, you know, buy, yeah, don't, you don't buy it. You read it, lyrics. you just don't take it serious, that's all. You read it, get into it, that's yeah. all. So, so you're not meant to take it seriously? No, of course you don't not. take every book you read seriously, especially if it's I fiction. I suppose not. But, but why, why such really black themes? You know, suicide, no. death and... Goes well, it's attractive and all of that. There's more bands out there singing about love. Mm. I mean, we're just looking at the other side. Well, it certainly beats singing about love. It's a different topic. Well, those of you who listen to it, what, what, what attracts you to this kind of music? Stephen Hogg, you're a great fan, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, I listen to it for the same reasons as has been mentioned. It's fantasy. Um, a lot of the music might be macabre, and I guess in the lyrics and things like that. But that's fine. I mean, you just have to read the Bible, take the Book of Revelations. I mean, <laughs> the seven plagues. I mean, you just read that. That's gross. I mean, you know, I've got a couple of quotes that I wrote down here from the Book of Revelations. Scorching men with fire. They gnawed their tongues for pain. Um, Thou has given them blood to drink. Well, that's the Bible. I mean, it's the thing that a lot of people go by, isn't it? Death metal's similar, I guess. You can take a band like Death and listen to their lyrics, uh, Spiritual Healing was one of the albums. Most of the stuff, it's not sort of going out there and saying, hey, look, get into violence, get into suicide. It's usually against it. If you ever read the lyrics in a lot of the uh, albums where they're printed, mm. it's usually don't do it, you know. But you see, it's been claimed, any criticism I read of it, I read of it claims that it, it leads to an obsession with suicide. I mean, it may be against suicide, some of these lyrics, I you may say, but... but d I yes? think that uh, <coughs> what we call it grind hard metal, it, it's... Uh, extreme form of art. It, it, it reflects today's society. Today's society is far more faster, it's form far more evil, should we say. And then we also would imagine, all the kids, so everyone would imagine in the past, the nuclear um, umbrella there and the destruction of future of mankind, perhaps. And today it is even destruction of the environment or everything like that. But I say this, that the kids who get into this music uh, are not basically weak uh, characters. The music is so aggressive and so powerful that you have to be 
fight positive and aggressive, powerful, to find it interesting and, and to find yourself associated with it somehow, mm -hmm. that you kind of understand it. I feel that uh, some of the lyrics are sure very extreme and very powerful and very, excuse me please, at times disgusting. Mm. I also like to state that uh, uh, the lyrics are totally not to be understood within singing, but I, I repeat, it's an extreme form of art and uh, uh, it's not meant to please everyone. However, no, well, it's certainly an extreme form of art, but you see, you, you touched on a point there that somebody else might like to pick up. Is it reflecting what you're thinking? Well, is it reflecting? I'd just like to yeah. someone else to comment on this, if you would. Is, that, is it reflecting? Yeah, well, Dennis Twilight, you, you don't exactly play that sort of stuff on your radio program, do you? But you're well, playing a lot of uh, pretty heavy, heavy metal music. Well, well no, no, we don't, Peter, but uh, I think the point needs to be made that this is, this is vaudeville, what, what we're talking here. It's just some kids having fun. It's something they enjoy. People who, who assume that this somehow leads to suicide, death, crimes, anything like that, they're the ones who should be in the asylum. So, you know, it's as simple as that. It's just kids enjoying themselves. Uh, uh, the death metal isn't something that I personally listen to all the time, but I more than respect these guys for their ability to play and also for people who want to listen to that sort of thing. Well, uh, is that the case? That's all it is. It's just, we're talking about freedom of speech here, I think. Yeah, really. right. Is that, is that the case? In terms of direction and stuff and the message, I mean, although it can be seen that there's many bands that, let's say, um, go to death and, and negative lyrics, there are, there are still other bands I'm not Christian or anything, but I'll say a Christian death metal band that has a positive message as well. So it all depends which side of the fence that you're looking at it from. In terms of like the media and stuff, I think they take a very negative stand on heavy metal mm. and that sort of stuff. Yeah, but those of you who listen to it, are you basically listening to it just for fun? No. You don't as listen to music for anything. Enjoyment. You listen to music for enjoyment. You don't listen to music to get depressed. I mean, why have music if you're going to get depressed? Mm. But we it just seems to me the themes are very depressing. It seems to it seems be hard to have fun with things like suicide and death. And it's just like a horror film. <clears throat> you sit down and you watch a horror film. You go in your room and you listen to some music. It's no different. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, it's like, to me, especially to like a lot of metal, it's always been an escape. It's always been a thing to like escape to from all the problems that you face in, in life. And, you know, it's, it's something, you know, especially with fantasy lyrics and things like that, it, t it takes you away from all the problems, you know, because they keep just going around inside your head all the time. I think it's like saying, why were there so many paintings from the Middle Ages that showed thousands of dead people from the Black Plague? <laughs> Because that's the way the world was. The world is going to hell in a handbasket and you're going to have some part of popular culture reflecting that. The fact that the mass media refuses to play music, with very rare exceptions, which isn't a love song. If you want a song on commercial radio to be a hit, that's very rare that it won't be a love song. So for anyone that's sick to death and about to gag on another baby I love you, the other stuff's there for us, you know? Well, I suppose... Um Yes. It's a catharsis. And what about Keats, like romantic poets and that? They um, have obsessions with, with suicide and with the inability of someone to grasp life fully, like Keats in the Grecian urn and a moment frozen in time and not being able to go beyond that to fully be alive and therefore there's no hope. I mean, he had tuberculosis and that and people are sick and, and die and it's reflected through art and poetry and that and the, the poetry is obsessed with the inability of people to fully realise themselves. Ah. So... Is, is Keats a metalhead? Yeah, well, I don't know. You see, I'm, I, I'm just trying to make sense of all this because you've said a number of things here between you. You've said, on one hand, you've said it's an escape. On the other hand, you've said it's fantasy. And on the other hand, you've said it's fun. That's why I'm trying to work out... Catharsis. And catharsis. So what are you getting out of this? Perhaps you can There's explain. There's a lot of aggression in the world. And it's there. It's right in front of your face. It's on TV. It's everywhere. You need to let it out. Just let it out. You'd look pretty stupid uh, singing a love ballad to music that's going at 100 miles an hour. Uh. It's that easy. You just got to let it out. Uh. I think you talked about four points there where it's like it's escapism and it's also reflecting, um, you know, a, a world that's gone to hell in a handbasket, as Tony said. I think it, it, is, it is both of those things that, at the same time. You know, for some people, for different people, it's different things at different times, obviously. And um, I don't think there's much difference really between the kind of heavy metal renaissance that is happening now and films that you see like Terminator 2, um, the Batman films, which are very gothic and very black and, and um, nihilistic. I don't think there's that much difference really. I think it does reflect, it does reflect the times and also that, that sense that people have to be really extreme 
in their positions. So in other words, we sort of move back to the Middle Ages with this fascination for, for, for Gothic horror. It's very and, Gothic, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Ronald Conway, um, you're one of the people who's concerned about this and the, and the likely effect on kids who are exposed to many hours of this kind of music. What, 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 what's your concern specifically? Well, I've heard a lot of talk to the effect that uh, this music reflects the violence and uh, hellishness of our society, but uh, is it in fact contributing to it? I've, um, I've heard these arguments and rationalisations put up for why people take dope uh, or why they uh, get wiped out at weekends on grog. Have we ever stopped to think, you know, that some of these arguments were sort of looking at sound as a kind of narcotic? Now, early in my career, I did a lot of work uh, in hypnosis with the use of sound. Now, the fact is that sound is not something you play around with. You know, it's a, it's a loaded pistol, it's a loose cannon. The French did experiments with infrasound, ultra-low frequency sound, and you get too much of it. It bursts your guts and you drop dead. Maybe mm. this is, maybe this is be the end of it all, <coughs> as far as I can see. But I understand there have been some specific, um, there have been some specific experiments done, uh, yeah. animal experiments, essentially, yeah. exposing animals to uh, long periods of aggressive sound. Mm. What was the result of that? Well, I, it's mainly done at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. It indicates that once you listen close up to music above, above 60 decibels, physiological changes start to occur. Arteries and capillaries start to narrow, blood pressure goes up, and you start getting jittery and twitchy. It's like the rationalisation for taking cigarettes. Everybody says, cigarettes relax me. But if you wire a person up, you find that <coughs> cigarettes don't relax you. They make you jumpier than ever. Mm. And, and uh, this could be said as an analogy to some of the music. I'm going to get my head kicked in for this, but I'm going to come straight out and say, this is not music. This is noise. There is mm. no recognisable beat. There is no melodic line. It's just, it's a gimmick. Uh, it's a vast gimmick. And I, well, I suppose we could argue all night about the, the quality of the music. I'm really interested in, in what effect it may or may not be having on people who it's, listen it's to it for extended periods. It's good fun for some periods. people. I'm not, not knocking it entirely. All I'm saying is, that it's not as harmless as it's made out to be. Mm -hmm. Then it's Twilight. You've been trying um, to say something when, here. when rock and roll music first started in the uh, mid to late fifties, uh, everyone took the lyrics of that and said, "Here it is. It's the end of civilization as we know it." And uh, a good forty years later, we, we all love Elvis and Jerry Lee and all that. And, and I think it's the same with this sort of music. It's just to the people who don't understand it uh, uh, and who can't possibly relate to it, it must seem like, yes, the world is coming to an end. But I put it to you, in 20 or 30 years' time, there'll be another Peter Couchman out there and they'll be talking about the new ultra-speed metal and they'll be saying, why isn't it like that good speed metal of back in the early 1990s? <laughs> <laughs> does it have a, an, an effect or doesn't it? Am I talking rubbish or aren't I? Well, Michael Schwartz, you, you're working with uh, disturbed kids, aren't you? And you see a very definite effect of this music on some of them. Tell us about what you see. I suppose we've covered a, a range of things that metal music provides for kids and I certainly see metal music as being cathartic and enjoyable and fun and part of a peer group but I suppose the kids that I see that I worry about are kids who become fixated upon metal music and I don't see it as necessarily causing them to become distressed or suicidal but part of their more general world view and they're experiencing feelings of hopelessness and alienation perhaps because they're unemployed or not working uh, up to standard in the educational system or coming from families where there's been significant conflict and abuse and for those kids it becomes perhaps a focus which validates their world view. It doesn't construct their world view, but it validates their world view. And it gives them a sense of the hopelessness of their situation. And it can be quite comforting in those circumstances. Mm, but you, you've seen uh, kids who've listened to this music for hours on end and have then um, uh, inflicted all kinds of injuries on <coughs> themselves. This seems to be part of it. Tell us about that. That's Ab what I was interested yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. They, um, the kids that I see who use this music for self mutilatory sorts of reasons find it once again it's a comforting experience this is something that they can relate to that helps them to understand why they are like they are in the world and the music gives them a sense of a relief doing something to their body gives them a sense of a relief but getting to back to the point that you were making about the kids in america who i guess were involved in this very issue and that is whether metal music causes depression and suicide and we look at the, these kids histories either the boys in Reno or the boy in California and we find that these kids suffered from significant problems right along the way they were heavily into drug usage they were unemployed they'd failed at school they came from backgrounds of enormous enormous violence and abuse and it's only part of a much larger picture all right well perhaps we should look more specifically at that case in Reno 
um, because I think it is, uh, it is very uh, enlightening on some of the points that we'll discuss here. And I really do want to get your reactions on this broad point because I think it's central to the whole thing. Now, this was a case that involved two boys in Reno. One of them was a boy called Ray Belknap. He was 18 years old and he died instantly when he pulled the uh, trigger that night. Uh, his, fr his friend, James Vance, followed him using the same rifle, but he didn't die. Tragically, he survived with the most horrific facial injuries. Now, of course, what's central to this case is what those two boys were doing that day. They'd locked themselves away in a room and had listened for hours to music by Judas Priest. But one song in particular, Beyond the Realms of Death. Now, both James Vance and the parents of both the boys claimed that that music had directly led them to the suicide pact. Now, this is what James Vance and his mother in particular had to say about how Judas Priest music affected him. <laughs> Judas Priest was his favorite band. He went out and bought studs to mimic Bob Halford. He went to their concert, came home highly excited that he even saw him in person. I didn't like it. It made me uneasy, it made me uncomfortable. His behavior would change. It made me almost turn me crazy, I would say, looking back at it now. And, uh, we would constantly fight. He said, did you understand what he said? He said, looking back now, the mu music would almost drive you crazy. It drives you crazy. It's a tragic result, isn't it? But in fact, James Vance had a lot more to say than that. He wrote a letter to Ray Belknap's mother in which he spelled out more specifically the reasons for their suicide. And that letter was later produced by her in the court case that was led against Judas Priest. Is that the letter? Uh, and photograph you received from James Vance? Yes. And what caused you to have a opinion about why your son committed suicide? This is what James said made him do it. I had to believe him. He was still here to talk to me. Would you tell me what it says? It says, I believe that alcohol and heavy metal music, such as Judas Priest, led us or even mesmerized us into believing the answer to life was death. Why do you think Raymond committed suicide that day? I think he was affected by the music he was listening to. I come to visit this place every so often. And I talk to Ray like a dead person. I don't expect an answer. But I do tell him what's on my heart, still. I would like to call certain people murderers. I feel that they murdered Ray. Well, Well, now, I'd just like to know how you react to that. What parents say is one thing, but we have the words of James Vance himself there, where he said in that letter to uh, Ray Belknap's mother, that music led us or mesmerised us into believing that the answer to life was death. But what do you actually say if you try and kill yourself, like they did, and you just turn around, you're still alive, he's dead. You've got nothing to really back yourself up. You say, oh, it was music. It's an easy cop-out. If I was locked up in a room all day and drank a slab of beer and smoked a heap of marijuana and I turned on Madonna, I think I'd want to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in that um, particular case there, it was found, they didn't mention that in the video, that those two kids have been uh, drinking all afternoon and smoking dope all afternoon as well. And one of the boys, I'm not too sure, had already tried a couple of years earlier to kill himself and failed. Um, on that record, where it said, if you get the message, do it, do it, do it, and that mm. song, you have to physically turn the record over, 
um, fix your record player, wire it backwards and play it by hand. But on the same, on the same side where it says allegedly do it, do it, do it, it's, uh, it says um, my girl likes peppermint, she's going to get me one and hey Mars, my chair's broken. And they took that back into court, the master tape played it backwards in court and the, day next, the next day, sorry, they kicked the case out of court. Yes, yeah, certainly the judge, the judge hearing that case did find that there were no subliminal messages and the Judas Priest was, uh, was cleared of the charge that was brought yeah. against them. But, uh, but it, it does raise some interesting points though, but doesn't I think, it, about the effect think, of music on people. Yeah, you've got to look whether the, kid was, or the kids were, you know, psychologically affected before they listen to the music, or they're psycho psychologically affected because of the music. I think it was just a case of they were psychologically affected before can't they listened to the music. Can't mentally stable in the first place. Can't blame yeah. music for someone killing themselves. Big pardon? Can't blame music for someone killing themselves. This music's been gone for over 20 years and there's one case, like, you know, out of all the millions of people able to hurt it, Yes, well, it's just there have been several cases in the United States. Yeah, but how, how many cases, how many, how many suicides groups? are there a year? You know, I mean, I reckon the percentage is pretty small, you know, for people like this to commit suicide, you know. I mean, two people commit suicide and they go make a big thing out of it. I mean, how many people that get into different styles of music commit suicide, you know? They don't go blaming that. It's got to be pretty mental and stuff. Um, like a love song shared between two couples or something, you know, like... That sort girlfriend of, or something. You yeah, split up with your girlfriend, song. you go listen to a nice long song and they're like, oh, my God, you know, and... That's it, you know. Life's finished, you got no girl left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they find them listening to one of them Cheers tapes, they don't make a deal out of it. But as soon as it's something heavy or something, then they do make a deal out of it. Big deal. Yeah, Toby Creswell. Um, the thing that, that, that seems very similar about this case is also that about in 1969, when, they, uh, when Charles Manson was being tried for the Sharon Tate murders, and Manson claimed at that point that he was receiving messages through Beatles albums and particularly um, the White Album, the Beatles White Album and this message held a skelter which he believed was uh, the call to a great race war in the United States. Now I mean nobody is accusing the Beatles of, of putting that message on that record. So I mean it, it's the same sort of thing, you know, it's like people are blaming the wrong person. They're blaming the, the they're blaming Judas Priest or, or the music rather than looking at the actual problem in the you know in in the family or in the United States particularly where these things are happening and um, there are huge problems that are not caused by heavy metal mm. the back it's just like um shifting the blames you know whether whether it was a drug problem for that guy or whether it was parental guidance he wouldn't be able been able to deal with himself if he'd you know tried just tried to kill himself you know he'd made the decision himself and you know if someone doesn't like the music they don't you know, they just don't, don't have to buy it or don't go see it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes, you're dead right. I mean, it has to be said here, in fairness, that these weren't exactly two well-adjusted middle-class boys. They were two boys who had problems. But this is the point that's made, I think, about this. If you get kids who have problems anyway, does this music then weigh on their minds to the point where they are led to suicide attempts? Or that have these problems which are, in fact, drawn to this kind of music. However, I, I won't interrupt. Well, you, you claim that, that kids with problems are the very, are the well, very people who are drawn to this You see, there's a lot of buck passing going on, as somebody <coughs> pointed out here, but all these factors interact with one another. Nobody's really suggesting that heavy metal by itself creates suicide, but it's one of the contributing factors in a pattern of events. Um, for example, I worked uh, professionally, legally, with LSD which is, you know, the dreaded LSD throughout the 60s. <laughs> now, the fact of the matter is that we had hundreds of cases of people who had, didn't have bad trips, they were, they were treated normally in a psychiatric setting. But the point is that the people who went mad and jumped off buildings were always the people who were attracted to its illicit use and knocked themselves off. Uh, so, it's, so, so in a sense, um, heavy metal is a, a risk to a minority, only, but it's a significant minority. That's the, end. That's the mm. point I make. I, I wish to say that... Sorry, I'm just coming to sorry. Stephen Hogg first. Significant minority, I mean, how big is a significant minority? You're talking about the metalhead metal uh, population as a whole, you're talking about just one or two percent of that or even less, and is that, is that such a minority? I mean, we call a, sign we call a significant minority uh, when we're talking about uh, politics or something, 30 percent is a sig significant minority. I wouldn't say that's a percentage of people who commit suicide or are likely to commit suicide after listening to heavy metal music. I wouldn't care for half of one percent 
If it meant a person's life, I'd call that significant. Yeah, but what I'm saying, yeah, I think, well, you, think you're missing the point, is if it, if it is half a percent, if it is one person out of a million people who listen to heavy metal and commit suicide, and there are other reasons, then why are we just slagging off heavy metal? And the other thing is, what about businesses? A man starts up a business, it fails, jumps off a building and kills himself. I mean, do we stop everyone having businesses? Yeah, I know, but this is the what about oh. argument. It's constantly... <laughs> shifting the blame around all the time to avoid the responsibility. I say it's one piece in the, in the problem. What you say a bit about businesses may be perfectly true, but that doesn't, get, that doesn't get you off the hook, mate. But heavy metal is not a cause. It might be a catalyst of a suicide in some cases. It is a contributing factor. It, 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 might be, it might be a catalyst at the time. So society. Mm. It, yeah, it might, be, it might be a catalyst at the time I when the person is very, very met. depressed. It's, it's certainly not a cause of a person to commit suicide, and I don't think it has that much, the way you're putting it, you know, it plays that much piece of the pie. Mm. I think it's a very small piece of the pie, if at any. Well, I think the, I think the person's lifestyle has a hell of a lot more to do with it than the little bit that you're saying it does. Well, if a whole pie is poison, why add, add, why add that extra bit? You want to make I, wish to say, I wish to say that uh, these rock and roll stars, like for instance, uh, uh, Black Sabbath or Judas Priest or whatever, perhaps do have a little bit more influence on people copying them, like if they've put picture on the side, mm. everyone else uh, tattoos their picture. But after all, we're talking about extreme type of metal. I don't think that that for starts is anywhere associated with uh, rock and roll. I think it's far more associated with Richard Wagner or perhaps uh, Magma or uh, Klaus Schulze or Richard Strauss or something like that. It's powerful mm. stuff. And I say that within then, uh, speaking for the death metal, if, if people really look, the parents really look very carefully, there is no drugs there, there is no heroin, there is no any suicides whatsoever as far as I know. I, I, I've been to Berlin, I've seen about six, seven, eight of those groups. I've seen different business people, I've seen different uh, uh, people in the audience. I, I've seen audiences of these so-called death grind metal is there. They are far too positive. They are listening to lyrics which would make uh, Ozzy Osbourne look like uh, Madonna. And, <laughs> and, 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 and yet these people, they're quite normal looking. There is no any tattoos perhaps on mm. some of them. But what I'm trying to say, these people have mind of their own, in my view. They, they are stronger intellectuals. They, they, they couldn't possibly like the music otherwise because it's such okay, powerful yeah, music. Right. I, I see your point, so you've got to be strong. It's also, as well, as another good point, the, uh, the instrument playing. I mean, you listen to some of the death grind and everything like that. You listen to the drums. It's fantastic what some of those guys do. I mean, they're bloody great. Yeah, it's pretty and cool. the guitaring, you know, as well. Yeah. And the way they get their voice when, when, when you get the grunge and the voice and it goes on and on and you keep, they keep it going. They're talented. And to sit there and say it's not music, as I heard before, is crap. <laughs> we, we, better, we better not get into that argument, because as I said, you can, you can never resolve an argument about what is music. Look, Dr. Graham Martin, I'm interested in what your research has shown, because you're one of the few people who's done specific research to try and measure what effect uh, exposure to this sort of music has on, uh, on, on, on kids in particular. You looked at a group of 15-year-olds, uh, I think, didn't you? Yes, we did, Peter. We looked at 247 youngsters. But perhaps I ju should just start back just one step, and that is where we're coming from is the fact that between 400 and 500 young people between the ages of 15 and 19 kill themselves in Australia every year. And as a psychiatrist, that is uh, quite a frightful figure. So we started to look at just what sort of factors might be involved, might be associated, uh, might be linked, possibly causal, but I have to say possibly. And when we looked at the uh, proper literature, the scientific literature, there were in fact only three very small studies that we could find. There was tons of stuff in the media, in the news, uh, on television, on radio, nothing in the scientific press. There were just two studies which looked and suggested a link between drug taking and heavy metal and one other one which looked at young people going into a psychiatric unit. There was no study which actually looked at ordinary kids in the street. So we went into two schools uh, chosen randomly and we asked year 10 students, uh, average age about 14 and a half, uh, what kind of music they liked, how they responded to it, and we asked them a whole range of other questions to do with uh, suicide, depression, etc., etc. There were a number of things that we found. Just let me talk about three of them. One was Heavy metal seems to be gender-based. About 73% of the boys said they liked heavy metal, whereas only about 20% of the girls 
said that they liked heavy metal, the rest saying they liked, liked pop music. Does that, does that sound right, uh, according to your experience? It's basically a male phenomenon? Yes. A young yes. male phenomenon? Yes. Right? Now, is that because it's aggressive? Yeah. And right. girls? You're not interested in it? Is this, is this right? Uh, no, uh, there are girls interested in it, but it, because it's so aggressive, I find that there are mainly boys who come... Well, I'm working in a shop, and there's mainly boys who come and buy it. OK, yeah, right. We'll carry on, Dr Martin. OK. The second thing that we found was that for the group of go girls who liked heavy metal as a whole, this 20% that we're talking about, and for a subgroup of the boys, there were very, very significantly high levels of a whole r range of factors. So depression as measured on a depression subscale, uh, suicidal ideation, that is thinking about your own death by suicide, having actually had a previous attempt at suicide, uh, an increase in tobacco use, marijuana use, alcohol use, other drugs. Um, and there were also some family factors. This whole sort of set of factors all seem to cluster with this group and not with those who were listening to uh, the pop music. Mm. Now, so that looked as though there was the beginnings of some kind of association. So the next thing that I have to say is we asked the kids whether they felt happier or sadder as a result of listening to the music. Now, what was interesting was that about 60% of them said they felt happier. And that fitted like very much... of all this aggression and quite possibly, dark thoughts and so quite on. Quite possibly. Getting rid of something. Mm. Um, but they felt happier, they felt better. And that fitted very much with uh, this, the looking at the pop music uh, preferers who also felt happier in about that kind of percentage. However, there was a small group of about 11%. And when we looked at that 11% of young people, they... All, in, all of those were severely depressed on the standards according to the depression subscale. Half of them had actually attempted suicide before and all of the other factors were significantly different from the rest of the group. So the, if we put that together with some of our other studies, it looks to, to us as though there is a grouping of these kinds of indicators in every single school that you go into. Every single study that we've done over a sort of 15 or so studies now suggests that there's this group there. Mm. It looks like that group, as it were, seek out the music, seek out people who are similar to themselves or where the messages resonate with their internal world. The sort of thing that Michael was talking about earlier. Mm. And it so makes them feel better because it's actually echoing their inner feelings. Yes, yeah, so I'm just trying to make sense of all this then. It, it would seem that it's associated with a whole range of adolescent problems. Oh, yes. And that many of the kids who are drawn to this are kids who have all these problems anyway. And those problems, in 11% of the cases you looked at anyway, are likely to be fed by the exposure to this music and exaggerate them all in their minds and perhaps not inconceivably lead to severe depression, despair, uh, even suicide attempt. How did, the, how did the rest of you react? Well, Dennis, uh, Twilight, you but obviously... Peter, I, I just have to say in fairness to, to all the hard rock fans everywhere that uh, there is no evidence anywhere of a link between hard rock, heavy metal and any sort of criminal or untoward behaviour whatsoever. You know, heavy metal fans, for as long as it's been going, have had to put up with well-meaning people who want to push whatever it is they're pushing and say that it look it does all these terrible things to you it doesn't the people who have committed suicide who have done whatever it is were disturbed in the first place the music had nothing to do with that and i'm really personally sick and tired of having to put up with people like this getting stuck into the music that i like and all these other people here like now look i don't think I don't think I don't think anyone's uh, I don't think anyone's trying to argue that the music but was to even solely give, responsible. Give this, this argument any credence to say this even the vaguest causal link is is a word we can't say on national television, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't matter if you took away the mu if you took away the music, <clears throat> these disturbed people would find something else. Exactly. Th th there would just be something else. You know, it's just crazy. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on what the uh, good doctor was saying earlier about the. Um, <laughs> about the um, the drawing of all the sort of the drugs and the alcohol and whatever to there. If you want to like talking about looking at drugs in different scenes, I mean, it's in the nightclubs, not the metal crowd. That's right. Like the nightclubs are the ones who are dealing all the ecstasy That's and the trips good, and all that yes. sort of stuff.
And also with the violence too. I mean, it's always in the news, the fights and the shootings and the stabbings and rapings are always at nightclubs. That's Metal right. gigs are really placid. Fair enough, everyone, you know, jumps around and has a good time or whatever, but it's calm. Everyone's there for a good time. They're yeah. friends. It's never any fights. Well, you need a Cohen, you're concerned about this, aren't you? Well, what concerns me is the lyrics, the messages of the lyrics of the music. It's not even so much the actual thumping, the, the sound of the music, but as I said, the lyrics and what what these groups are putting out, that's what I find disconcerting, particularly towards young teenagers that are listening to this. And I mean, they're at an age, particularly young boys, like 13, 14, right? They're trying to find themselves. They're really quite influenced by this music. As I said, it's not so much the actual sound of the music, but the messages that these lyrics that they're putting out, that's what I find sort of somewhat unsettling, to say the least. Yeah, so it's the messages in the lyrics, the messages, rather than the specific mm, lyrics themselves yeah, exactly. that concern the you. Messages. And I mean, you know, if you were to cut it out and say, well, listen, you can't listen to that, well, you know, they'll go to a friend's place and listen to it at a friend's place. So, you know, you, you can't sort of win, you can't sort of ban it and say, well, listen, I don't think you should listen to that, because there seems to be a drawing with this music, not so much the music, well, music and lyrics, which seems to be drawing um, younger teenagers to this sort of thing. And I just sort of wonder, what type of effect perhaps it does have. I mean, OK, you can sort of say, well, it's not going to affect everybody, and yes, they're not all going to go out and commit suicide, but as the doctor said, you know, there are cases where it does. Mm. Yeah. I suppose what concerns you and, and, and other parents like you is the preoccupation with, with death and suicide and all these but dark the themes thing. by so it's many young... Same, yeah, and it's the same theme. All these, all, it's all the same thing over and over again. It's this preoccupation with this, this sort of negativity. What, what, what about uh, some of the lyrics of some of the pop artists? Let's get away from the death metal. Take Billy Joel, song Captain Jack, it's about cocaine. Tony Childs, House of Hope, that's uh, the song off that, I think I've got to go now. That's the one where, you know, the old man beats up on the wife and she hasn't got the guts to leave. That's negativity. What about Tracy Chapman inciting a revolution? Negativity. So there you go. There's that's a few of them as well. That and that's pop this music. That's well. pop music stuff that mum and dad listen to. Millions you know? of more people listen and to Nicole? The way I see it, music is music, right? Now, I particularly don't like deaf, fresh, whatever you call it. I have my own band. We play funk music. My job in that band is to entertain my audience. People's job here in their bands is to entertain their audience, not to persuade someone to have su make suicide. Now, this gentleman over there said that that's not music, that's noise. It's music. They've had their drumming lessons. They've had their guitar lessons. They know how to play an instrument. If they prefer it to play it that way, fine. People are going to appreciate that. It's their type of music, and I have my type of music, I sing it, and people appreciate that. You said uh, up the back there, I think, so. Well, do you want to make your point first, and then I'll... Oh, well, just quickly, I, I would suggest that as much as if you put a lab rat strapped down in front of uh, some death metal for 48 hours, it probably will kill itself. <laughs> if you put any of us strapped down in front of a chair in front of Macbeth, for 48 hours or some of Shakespeare's wackier works you get a similar response you know it's 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 the, the problems there it's not necessarily death metal that will put it off Shakespeare would do the job just as well <laughs> well somebody up the back there said a moment ago so what do you want us to do about this perhaps one of the things we need to try and do is to understand why young kids 15 14 year olds who've got their whole life in front of them who should be filled with the joy of the world are attracted to such black themes uh, so preoccupied some of them with death and suicide and violence and anarchy and so on get in well those are the, those are the kids that are coming up in a society where there is so much unemployment there is so much blackness in the world those are the kids that are going to be drawn to that sort of stuff because that'll be their only release. Like, there's nothing much a 14, 15, 16 year old kid can do these days without getting into trouble for something. So, of course, one way of releasing themselves is sitting in their room listening to this sort of music, listening to any sort of music. Mm -hmm. Can I ask everyone, did anyone feel violent or aggressive while we were playing? Did anyone feel like getting up and killing someone or...? <laughs> I'll tell you what. Oh, that was an our fault. But you get, there's more aggression at the footy than at a gig. Yeah. Oh, Toby Creswell, uh, why do you think kids, uh, young kids in particular, are, are, are being so drawn to these uh, deep and macabre themes? Um, well, the thing with, I mean, heavy metal, without like wanting to get into too gross a generalisation, heavy metal is, is, has always been more of a, of a working class thing than, than, uh, than anything else. And like, proper, real hardcore heavy metal, rather than the soft metal that, that's on the charts at the moment. Um, it comes from 
what this guy over here was saying. It's very much an era of unemployment, an era of kind of alienation and um, a lack, lack of hope, I think, that, that really um, has spurred this music on at the moment. But also that thing of, of wanting to push it a bit further, wanting to have like a, a real sort of cartoon sort of um, response to things rather than to sort of sit down and go into a kind of subtle analysis and, and do a sort of Bob Dylan number on the whole thing. Is, is that right, those of you who violence. listen to it? Is it is it is it a result of the sort of alienation you feel being locked out of the system? Why is it yes? that? Well, it's yeah. identification, I think. Like the Triple R, the reason that we play it on the station is that it simply doesn't get played elsewhere. And that predominantly, what commercial radio finds out is that, aside from mainly boys between about the age of 15 and 22, no one else likes it. So it's like joining an exclusive club. But when you go into a heavy metal shop, or indeed you look at a heavy metal audience, you've got to remember too, it's a capitalist society that we live in, uh, that music is one part of the marketing. But overwhelmingly, the number of T-shirts, the paraphernalia, the, the caps, the, the badges, all that kind of stuff, there's no other music form that in a way music is such a minor part of that it's actually a tribe that young males all around the world join. And what it means is that a kid in Ringwood might have more, co more in common with a heavy metal fan in Utah than they do to their next door neighbour. It's a sense of belonging, but essentially to an exclusive tribe because most people don't like two forms of music, and that's why we play it on our radio station, oh. heavy metal and real rap. And I yeah, I know, but you still haven't explained to me why they're attracted to it. Identification with a tribe, it's joining something. It's joining something that spans the world. It's an international tribe. We're having a band here from Brazil soon. I mean, is, is it because it's a cult and it's shocking to so many middle-aged people? Yeah, it's exclusive. Uh, antisocial? Yeah, I mean, rock and roll is supposed to be antisocial. It's not supposed to be the sort of thing that um, the professors and your parents like. I don't know if they did like it, what would be the point of buying it anyway? But you know, that's the paradox. It, it is antisocial, but it's also very profitable. And we got the commercial note coming in here. And the, the point that the chap made down there a moment ago about it being on a continuum with the rest of pop music is perfectly correct. I mean, there are some messages in ordinary pop music which are just as bad. This is the fag end of a whole trend. The, there's nowhere else to go after this. I mean, you've worked, worked through sex, you've worked through aggression, uh, you've worked through alienation. The only thing left is death. But the trouble with death is, once you do it, there's no replay. Academicide. And... The point is that uh, this industry is worth five billion dollars in the United States alone. It's big money. Mm. And who are being exploited? You are. Oh. <laughs> Professor LSD here. <laughs> no notion. Uh, I work in the record industry, have done for years. He has, he's just saying these things baldly because he thinks he can get away with it. Let me tell you, people of Australia, he has no notion of what proportion of the market heavy metal makes up. In particular, the portion of, of uh, the market that this sort of metal, the death, thrash, whatever you want to call it, metal makes up, is so infinitesimal. If you wanted to make a buck in music, you don't go into death metal. You don't, maybe you don't even go into heavy metal. The bands that make a real good living out of it that are in the, the top ten money makers or whatever, they're, they're crossover bands. They don't go hardcore on this sort of stuff because it doesn't sell. Any argument that came from that little conclusion there is absolute rubbish because it's just not true. <laughs> Not just heavy metal. Heavy metal just a fair game. <laughs> Somebody up the very back one. Yeah, um, heavy metal bands are obviously targeting um, the most vulnerable groups um, in the population. But everyone seems to be painting the picture that it's all about death and sorrow. I mean, I personally don't like death metal and all that sort of music, but it doesn't mean everyone in the population is sad and about to commit suicide. I mean, I don't see any people here who listen to death metal who look like they're go out, going to go out and slip their wrists. I mean, it's just, it's just a stereotype that heavy metal is about death and sad things like that, but it's not really relevant to the majority of listeners, I don't think. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, Michael Schwartz, I'm just interested in your observations as to why young boys in particular are so attracted to this sort of stuff. Well, I suppose I'm interested in why people are concerned about it now, given that metal music's been around now for well over 20 years and Judas Priest was writing songs about suicide a long time ago, as was Ozzy Osbourne. And I think it reflects the issues about alienation, unemployment, the breakdown of the family, the things that society has almost holding dear in myth-making proportions. And teenagers, 
particularly teenagers who've experienced uh, difficulties with their families, difficulties in the education system, difficulties in the workplace, look for something that's going to validate the alienation that they're experiencing. And that's becoming increasingly common, unfortunately. And I think our concern about heavy metal is a much broader societal concern about what life is like for teenagers. And I think to scapegoat heavy metal music is completely missing the point. I don't think that heavy metal is formative in terms of teenage <coughs> despair. It may be something that teenagers who are desperate gravitate towards, but there are so many other reasons why they would gravitate toward it than the music itself that I think we're completely missing the point. Uh -huh. So, what is the point then? Are we taking it too seriously? Yes. 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 I think, I mean, how many people here, if your parents tell you not to do something, first thing you do is you go out and do it. The more fuss you make about it, the more people are going to go buy it and listen to it. I mean, you're stressing about it too much. Everybody's going to listen to it the more you stress about it. I think one of the problems with heavy metal, as well as with um, maybe your colleagues, including yourself, is uh, having to wear a uniform. And um, it's putting on a coat of arms to give yourself um, a way of looking like your friends and a way of being. And why do you have to wear a suit? Why do, they, why do you guys have to wear black t-shirts that you bought and paid $25 for instead of buying a blank t-shirt, getting some fabric paint, and um, putting, feeling the emotions you get from the music and putting that onto the shirt in your own way instead of buying it. And why do you have to wear a suit to be credible on TV? Mm. Why? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. But so in a sense, it's a rebellion against it's a rebellion against conformity, and it's a rebellion it's, it against conformity. all those other kids no, in the a, generation who are achieving and striving and wearing the uniform. I think it's, it's different essentially conservative. I think that what you're looking at is people who want to join something, not people who want to move away from something. And getting back to the capitalist thing, I mean, bands want to sell more records, not less. If their audience is killing themselves, it's counterproductive. <laughs> <laughs> but really, to me, the biggest criticism of heavy metal or death metal is it's essentially escapist, as opposed to, say, rap, which is essentially realistic. And that really one of the things about metal music is it's conservative because it maintains the status quo. It's bourgeois music. It isn't to do with social change. It's to do with individual kind of psyche and neurosis. It's not to do with going out and changing anything outside yourself. All right, well, look, I think on that note we'd better end the discussion. Uh, just for those of you who may have the daylight scared out of you by all this, just remember what Stephen said there. It's essentially bourgeois and conservative. Okay, that's it for tonight. See you all next week. Good night. <coughs>